Thanks, everybody. So as, as Joe mentioned, uh, there's going to be a different sort of talk. Um, and uh, so just a quick disclaimer, though. So this is, all ver this is all personal history. So this is all, like, stuff that happened to me. And like any, like any portrayal of the history, um, it's a gross oversimplification of everything that happened um, and extremely self-serving. So bear that in mind. Um, like, like any history, uh, this, this serves my ends. Uh, and others were involved, some in the room, so um, I'm sure there'll be tomato throw, tomatoes thrown and so forth. Um, and you know, people have seen it differently, but this is basically some of the things that I learned, and hopefully, I know there's at least one other person considering starting a monitoring company in the audience, so hopefully it's helpful to someone. Um, yeah, this, that's not gonna work. All right. uh, yeah, so another Jeff Hodges quote tonight. So that's two for a meetup, so we're at capacity. Uh, this, this one really resonated with me because it's so incredibly brutal. Um, <laughs> and because it was also my story too, right? Like a systems engineer without a good startup idea inevitably ends up doing monitoring, right? Um, and I, I've done it, I've seen it since. I'm sure I'll continue to see it in the future. Uh, and I'm sure that systems engineers will continue to ignore it. That being said, uh, hopefully, hopefully some people won't, or at least learn from it. So this is me back in 2009. Uh, so I was, so when, when I first came to San Francisco, I started, a, 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 so I, I joined a company called uh, PowerSet. And uh, back in 2009, PowerSet had been sold to Microsoft. Um, so I was working at Microsoft, just kind of waiting for the, uh, you know, golden handcuffs to come off. And, uh, you know, Boundary, Boundary kind of started as a, as a side project between me and a, a couple buddies. And it was like a weekends and nights sort of thing because to be honest, you know, doing a bunch of C-sharp really wasn't all that fun, and uh, I wanted something to, to, engage my, uh, to engage my brain. So. <laughs> so the idea, the idea, the original idea for Boundary, and this was before it even had the name Boundary, was that we wanted to be like a, uh, uh, we wanted to be a Google Analytics uh, for network data. And if anyone's ever used the Google Analytics, Google Analytics API, uh, very similar uh, ideas, is we just wanted to clone that API and use it for networks data. This is literally the extent of the idea. It was, like I said, you know, systems engineers <laughs> trying to do a startup. Um, and, and then, even better, uh, why network data? Um, that was us saying, like, whoa, you know, we, we want to tackle the hardest data set first because that's what you do. You tackle the hard problems first. And we estimated, oh, that's going to be the largest machine data set. So we're going to get the network data. You know, it's all very high cardinality. Um, and you know, eventually, we're going to bring all of the te all of the IT ops data together. But you know, start with the network. Okay. Um, so we worked on this for like one and a half years, nights and weekends, kind of you know, slowly trudging along uh, in our own time. We went through about uh, three revisions of the prototype. Um, so we started with off-the-shelf technology, Cassandra, as you do. Uh, this is Cassandra 0.6-ish. So it was it was special. <laughs> Um, you know, but, but yeah, we started with a lot of off-the-shelf stuff, uh, and that didn't work. And so then we started getting crazy with it, uh, and then that worked a little bit more. Uh, we kept doing weirder and weirder things, and, um, you know, sort of to, to, <laughs> to, to cut through a lot, of the, a, lot, a lot of the stuff. Like, I ended up uh, hard forking Cassandra, um, writing whole new read and write paths through it. Um, we almost got to the point of implementing our own file, our own file format with it, which would have been even more fun. Um, but, but essentially, like, the, the scale that we were aiming for um, and the test data we were putting through it just, just could, you know, we, we, we kept, you know, striving for this, this massive idea of scale. And we had this idea fixed in our heads that, oh, if we can, if we can fix the big problem, then we'll, we'll be set. Um, and, you know, I mean, uh, and Ray spoke to this, uh, some of these things earlier, but, like, I mean, the fundamental problem that we had so much trouble reconciling was the trade-off that a system like Cassandra makes between ingest rate and query speed. So ingest was fine, uh, queries were very slow. But anyway, we went through three revisions, and then after we got to the point with the prototype where uh, it would like kind of work, kind of sort of work pretty well, um, we finally, in grand Silicon Valley tradition, uh, we got funded. <laughs> you know, t literally two dudes and some code that didn't kind of, that kind of sort of worked. Um, we, went, we wound up raising a $4 million Series A round. So that's cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, the premise was is that, hey, this thing's like, 
you know, this thing's all, almost ready to go and we just have a little bit more to do and, and then we'll be ready to start selling it. Uh, it turned out not to be the case. Uh, so several months after funding, we, you know, we, we just kept running into the same problems. Uh, and we were, we were li literally looking down the, the, the barrel of, okay, we can either um, start to, we can either rip out the last of the Cassandra innards and start to re-implement like the file system and just getting into some very crazy deep dark waters there of like limitless work, <laughs> essentially. Um, or, um, you know, it became very clear that we needed to do something uh, very different. Uh, and so our fourth prototype was based on stream processing, which you've heard quite a bit about this earlier tonight. But bear in mind, this was in uh, early 2011. Um, so Storm didn't exist, Kafka didn't exist, uh, nothing existed to, to do this essentially. It was like you had Hadoop and more Hadoop. So neither of which do anything like this. <laughs> so it, it, you know, we had to do everything from scratch, um, which kind of sucked. And we'll, we'll get into the, the ramifications of that later because there are quite a few. Um, but we started building the fourth prototype based on stream processing and we broke from this sort of, you know, ingesting query, you know, traditional database model, um, which actually worked kind of well. Um, the data comes in, we compute streaming queries against it in memory, uh, and then we, of course, we store the much smaller aggregates of that data, um, which is good. And eventually, so like one year after we got funded, we, we uh, you know, were able to get the, the beta out in, into the public and, and eventually launched the, the GA product. Uh, which was good. Um, it, was a, it was a hell of an accomplishment, uh, and the team did, did a lot of work. Speaking of team, so we're going to get into like the business foundry startup guru side of things, so I apologize in advance if this bores the hell out of you. Uh, but one of the weird things about this job is that you start this job, well, if you're on the tech side, like if you're the, you know, the, the coding founder or whatever, um, uh, the, the proto CTO or whatever you want to call it, you, your, your job is weird because you start your job trying to build the thing, uh, and then you build the thing poorly, probably. We all do it. Uh, you build the thing poorly, and then you get funding, and then your job shifts completely because then you keep thinking, well, I should keep building this thing, but then your job is actually, post-funding your job is building the team um, because a team, turns out, gets things done a lot faster than you. <laughs> uh, and, and that's what the money's for. Uh, so, you, so you build the team, and uh, just as importantly, you build the culture. Um, and the interesting, out, the interesting thing here is that the product eventually, like the, the real finished product, which looks nothing like your prototype because it was a piece of crap, um, the, the real product is, is the, the output of that team plus that culture that you built. Um, and if you weren't mindful of either of those things, uh, things might come out weird. <laughs> um, and so yeah, we're, gonna, we're going right into the cliches and the tropes here. So like, I'm a startup guy telling you about culture, sorry. So what's culture? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add another definition to your lexicon. Um, so culture is really the shared, the shared values of the team, both spoken and unspoken, which is a really squishy, shitty definition. So let's get into it. Uh, distributed systems. So culture is distributed consensus um, for the team. So if you think of everyone, and it's very reductive, right? But uh, bear with me here. Like if you think of everyone on the team as a, as a worker, a remote worker, or like a node in a distributed system, What's gonna be faster if they all know exactly what to do and don't have to talk to anybody? Or if they all have to check on everything, every decision they make with some higher authority? Which, that's a global lock, right? So, uh, you know, if you can avoid the global lock and if they can have sufficient data and context uh, to make decisions independently and know that they're gonna be right, um, that's how you're gonna end up with a team that does a lot of stuff and doesn't, uh, and, and doesn't end up blocking on you as the manager or you as the, the, the founder. Um, so like culture is that sort of distributed consensus system where you don't have to rely on the, the coordination, uh, essentially. Um, and that's why culture ends up being very, very important um, because if everyone's on the same page about here's what we're building and more importantly, here's why, and, and here's what the end goal looks like, um, they end up building things that, that, um, that are much more useful and valuable and that you don't really have to micromanage, which is good on, on all accounts. But the interesting thing about culture is that it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. Um, and so culture and technology, I think, um, you know, and a lot of people talk about this as tech debt. It is, it is absolutely the wrong metaphor. Um, so culture and technology reinforce each other um, on an ongoing basis. So because as your team works, 
they build new technology, they utilize technology outside of, the, outside of your business, um, and then that technology informs the evolution of the culture. And the two sort of go hand in hand and, and lockstep down the, down the path, and they form a, this concept called like path dependence, which is just really, you know, it's a really simple concept that like, you know, the decisions that you've made in the past constrain the things that you can do in the future, which sounds very grossly simple, but it, you know, um, if anyone here has been at a startup for a very long time, which, it, it, show of hands, who, who here has been at a startup from like an early stage to a late stage, who's made that transition? Yeah, okay, so all of, you, all of you people, have you ever had a new person come onto the team and they ask you, why did you make this decision? Why did you build this? Why did you pick this? And, and you just kind of sit there and you think, and you say, you know, Reasons. <laughs> That's path dependence, right? So, so in other words, like in the context of the time that you made the decision, it, it may have been the right decision. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to say that. In hi- it's so easy to say that in hindsight. But the reasons and the, the, the entire context of why you made that decision is completely lost to the sands of time unless you're completely scrupulous about documenting those things, which no one is. Um, and so, so you did this for reasons. Uh, and because you did this for reasons, now those contribute to the reasons why that new person's <laughs> going to make this other bad choice. Uh, so, it's, so that's path dependence, right? Is that what comes before informs what comes after um, to, a, to, to, a, to a drastic degree. Um, and again, people describe it as tech debt, but it's not. Um, you know, tech debt, so d- debt usually has two or maybe more stakeholders if you have one of those subprime mortgage things. Um, but, but, you know, you have much, much fewer stakeholders, but, you know, with, with technology, you have the engineers, product, marketing, the customer, investors, you know, your mom in Indiana who no, doesn't know what the hell you do. <laughs> so, there's a lot more that goes into it um, than just a simple loan. And this brings us to another interesting one, very topical, the Overton window. Is it, er, has anyone heard of this concept before? The Overton window? Okay, so it's, a, it's a, another very simple concept from political science. Um, the Overton window it basically is a prediction of, um, it's a way of predicting uh, w- what, are the, what are the acceptable policy choices of a political entity. So if you think about a political candidate um, or an agency, um, they, they always have constituents and stakeholders, right? Uh, and based upon the, the political beliefs of those stakeholders, there is an acceptable policy window. In other words, um, to, to, to make it very relevant to, to, to what's going on right now, so if Ted Cruz tomorrow said, hey, abortion's okay, um, that is completely out of his Overton window. Um, and if we look at the, the, both the Bernie and the Trump campaigns, um, that is a failure of the Overton window because neither of those parties could have predicted that those things would have flew um, uh, before 2016. So, yeah, so the Everton window, uh, but, but I think the Everton window is, is very useful uh, as a way of explaining what happens on, not just, uh, not just on, on in your own team, but also if you have a technical product, in which if you're starting a monitoring company, you, you damn well do, uh, it also explains uh, something about the adoption of your products. Um, so, uh, in other words, a lot of people like to kind of cynically say that uh, technology is fashion. I think technology is kind of politics. Uh, so a good, a good example of this is that if you have a team, uh, so actually Labrado is probably a good, a good, uh, a good example of this. Um, so if you were on the data science or the data engineering team of Labrado and you uh, decided to introduce uh, something on the data side that was Node.js, I'm pretty, sh- I've never worked at Labrado, but I'm pretty sure that's out of the Overton window. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's out of the Overton window. And, 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 and to, be fa- like, to, to be clear, it's, 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 it's going to be out of the Overton window if, uh, regardless of its merits whatsoever, just because it is politically unaccept- unacceptable to the team. Um, and, you know, on, on my team, uh, Clojure became out of the Overton window, and, and I was the only Clojure programmer. And as CEO, there's one of me, there's a lot more of them. So, uh, yeah, Clojure very quickly became out of the Overton window. That, that's the way it works. Um, but, you know, also on the customer side, right? Um, so, like, to, to take it back to the NoSQL days, which I um, were, were, you know, near and dear to my heart, um, one of the reasons why uh, Cassandra flew ahead of, of, say, like, you know, Basho, 
uh, is because Erlang is way the hell out of the Overton window of most enterprises. You know, most enterprise operations people do not want to see a bunch of tuples in a, tax, in a stack trace. Erlang doesn't even actually have stack traces, but they didn't at that time. But um, yeah, Erlang is weirdware, and it's way the fuck out of the, the Overton window for, for most teams. And because Cassandra was JVM, uh, it was okay. That's the way it is. Um, so yeah, and I mean, people wave it away as fashion, but it's not fashion, it, it is politics. Uh, we shouldn't shy away from politics. Anywho, that was all a big tangent to say, like, here's what we did at Boundary. We built a team of systems engineers um, who were very quickly, and, and, and they had very good reasons for, for, for believing these things, right? So, the, so I'm not blaming them. They weren't wrong. But they became very suspicious of, like, a lot of NoSQL stuff and OSS because, like, you know, the scale that we were working at uh, broke most stuff. When you work at scale, things break. As Ray, you know, said, like, why didn't you do X, Y, and Z? Because those things break at the scale you're working at. Um, you know, that, that's, that, that in, in and of itself is, is part of your path dependence, right? Because you have requirements, and if the scale requirements are such that you can't use these things, well, they get tossed out, out of hand. Um, you know, and so at Boundary, we developed a very strong uh, preference for in-house tech. And, and, I, I, and so I am especially guilty of this. I was extremely overconfident of our complexity budget. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of this concept before, but like, one interesting way to think about technology is like technology ownership. Um, and like by, by ownership, I mean, you know, everything that you sort of bring in house and that you, you, you maintain yourself um, is, is, is a bit of complexity. Uh, and then that complexity has a human cost. Uh, so people have to maintain it. They have to deal with it. They have to, you know, uh, babysit it if it's noisy in production. Uh, and so complexity is a, so your complexity budget is, y you know, you can roughly draw a line between like the complexity of the system and the number of engineers needed to, to keep it up and running. So like if you see a, a startup announce their, their funding and they're coming out of stealth with a 20, en 20 person engineering team, they perhaps have overestimated their complexity budget. Uh, <laughs> that's probably, might not work out well for them. But th that, that, that said, right, like th that's, th these are just ways of, of like, figuring out, okay, are we taking on too much? Can we solve easier problems? Anywho, so for Boundary, on the business side, um, we kind of constructed for ourselves a house divided. Um, so we were trying to add paying, uh, you know, as uh, we were a venture-funded startup, we were adding paying customers as fast as possible, as we, as we possibly could. Um, and so many of our deals required custom work. Um, and, and, and then the, the, the feature work, the, the custom work that was required, uh, we had to go tinkering around in our streaming systems at a very deep level. Streaming systems that had contractually obligated performance requirements, which are always fun. Like you actually have a contract that stipulates you need to, to, uh, you need to, to process one million records per second per node because that was a good idea. Um, that's probably my fault. Um, you know, and, and then we had scaling issues that limited the size of the customer that we could sell to, right? So we, we, we ended up in this very weird place where um, you know, um, our general unwillingness as a company to let, let off the gas and to like take a few, like take it on the nose for a few, few quarters, right? Like miss a few quarters now so that you could fix fundamental problems and like rebuild later. We were completely unwilling to do that until it was entirely too late. And uh, so to bring that into like focus of like product market fit, and, and by the way, product, a lot, lot of, again, we're startup tropes, startup guy talking about product market fit. Um, it's so much easier to figure out in hindsight, right? Uh, so I'll tell you what we did wrong. Um, I think I'm doing it more right this time. We'll see. But, uh, you know, the Boundary product was, was just an odd duck in, in, the, in the market. Um, so we were, we were ingesting network data, only network data. Um, and, it, and we weren't really thinking about the structure of the teams we were selling to. Uh, and, and really the person on the other end of the sale when, when, we, were, when we were building this stuff. Um, turns, out, <laughs> turns out network engineers understand the value of the data. No problem. Uh, network monitoring tools have been sold forever, and they will be probably sold as long as we have networks. The problem was that as soon as you tell the network engineer that, oh, we're going we're gonna to take your data from, the, from every end host, they immediately flip the bozo switch on you because they don't care about the end host. It was, a, it was a very simple sort of like Overton window kind of thing where the network engineers were like, oh, 
an agent on the host. The host isn't my problem and it's not my, it's not my domain. I can't install an agent. D don't you have an appliance you can sell me? No, we didn't have an appliance. Uh, and so, so that was a non-starter. So the people that could see the value couldn't buy it. Uh, and then selling it to ops teams, the ops teams struggled to find the value because the ops teams, many of them did not have a network engineering background, especially ones who, you know, all they had ever seen was the cloud, right? So if you didn't have some, you know, some, some wizened gray beard like network engineer from forever ago saying, oh yes, this is amazing, I love this. If you didn't have that person with a network engineering background, you, could, you basically couldn't make the sale because they couldn't understand why the data was special, why it was good, why the, what they could get out of it. Um, and so that, that really limited our ability to, to like that the Venn diagram keeps getting smaller and smaller of like people are hunting down and trying to find. Um, and, then, and then on top of all that, um, you, you know, because of the, the scale requirements and because like everything was per second metrics and per second delivery, um, it was extremely expensive to deliver. And so people who couldn't find sufficient value, um, we, we were unable to sell to them because we would, we would be like losing money on just the compute time, right? So just the, 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 the raw like server's capacity to, 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 to serve these, to, to like to crunch the data, wouldn't be worth it to us. Um, and then one of the other problems is that like as a company, we were very reticent to like go head to head competitively with another product. Um, we kept wanting to be this weird different thing. We kept wanting, I mean, like network data, no one else is doing that, okay, good. Um, you know, we didn't want to go head to head with New Relic, we didn't want to go head to head with anybody until it was way too late. And finally, like when we finally did have like a metrics product, which is, you know, was competitive to Labrato and Datadog, it was way too little, way too late. Anywho, postmortems are very good in engineering and we don't do them often enough in the startup world. Um, in the investment world, it is virtually unheard of, um, which is, yeah. Uh, anyway, like if I, if, you know, there, there was plenty of things that we did wrong, um, more than I could enumerate in this talk, more than are even relevant. Um, but, you know, if, if I could distill it down to like three, uh, three fatal or critical things, um, we were really, we were always just a technology chasing a problem. Um, and we raised way too much money too soon. And that's a big one, right? And so these all kind of feed into each other as well. Um, because investors love making gigantic bets on speculative technology. Why? Because remember, investors are reformed technologists themselves, right? So like they love, they, you know, many of them love like cutting edge stuff um, and they will convince themselves, oh, this is going to be super disruptive and they can afford to make these bets because they're diversified and you're not. So like if you go bust, it's not the end of the world for them as long as they've covered their ass sufficiently. Um, so they'll make a speculative bet if you can spin a great story about, you know, n-dimensional cuboids and OLAP and all this other crap that I've pitched to death. Um, and, and you can get a lot of money that way. Um, very hard to make that pan out. You don't realize that until it's all said and done. And <laughs> yeah, and, and the problem is, is that when you raise that money, um, it's always gonna be early stage and then the bar is set that much higher for you because it's like, oh, okay, what did you do with this? You raised $4 million, we, like the bar gets higher and higher and higher every time until finally it like kills you. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can't jump that high, boom, decapitation. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so things to watch out for. Um, and I mean, fundamentally, like unwilling to, we were just very unwilling to miss the sales numbers in order to fix the fundamental issues. And this goes to like, you know, top, top leadership, right? Like if, if top leadership, uh, people when backed into a corner will like go to their happy place. And if your happy place is, you know, I'm a salesperson and I can't miss my numbers, that could be bad. Uh, if your happy place is, I'm gonna go write some code, that actually also might be very bad. If your happy place is, oh shit, we need to fix the product, maybe that's good. Um, things to watch out for, think about. Um, anywho, post-mortem aside, let's talk about the future, nice things. Um, so uh, towards the end there, I spent a lot of time thinking like, uh, what, if I, what if I had a clean slate? N n you know, I didn't have this enterprise legacy system to like, you know, keep me up in the middle of the night and customer support. Like, like what if I had, what if I could start over with, you know, it's the, it's the usual fantasy, right? Like if I knew then what I knew now, what, what could I do with it? Um, you know, uh, and after four ways, of, four, four years of, of plugging away at Boundary, I spent, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and you know, what I came up with 
was like, you know, okay, let's let's pick. And obviously, this looks pretty stupid and self-explanatory, but it was completely new to me as an engineer. Uh, pick a customer and solve an everyday problem very elegantly. Um, and an important one is invest in the things that matter to the customer, uh, not plumbing if you can afford it, right? So, like, in other words, a uh, it's kind of a cliche now, but like, you know, you don't go to a restaurant because the toilets are awesome. Maybe like in Japan or something, but like, not, you know, usually you don't go to a restaurant because the toilets are awesome. But if the toilets if the toilets are broken, that's actually a problem, um, which you might need Super Chief, right? But Maybe it's a buffet. Um, uh, but, but no, I mean, like, you got to invest in the things that are actually going to matter to the customer and, like, the, their experience and what, you know, uh, how they interact with your product. And, and then the other thing is, like, you just got to have to solve a problem that a lot of people have. The more people it applies to, the easier your, your time is going to be. Um, so these were, like, sort of the, the, the things we, we started out with, with, you know, the, the very beginnings of the idea for Opsi. Um, and so the other thing that I really realized with Boundary is that we, you know, you can't have the product and engineering side of, the, like the, the day, so it used to be this model where like you could have this, this highly technical product and then just bolt a sales org onto the side of it and then that sales org is just gonna go out and take people to golf or whatever and sell a bunch of shelfware, dead. Those days are over, it's gone. You can't do that anymore. Uh, so you can't just slap a sales org on it and call it good. Um, product, marketing, everything has to be built as one big system. And that, that system is, has to be built with, uh, you know, how does the customer find you? What are they looking for? Why do they come to you? How do they get value out of the product? How do they consume the product? How do they pay for the product? Et cetera. It's all, like, it's all, like, it sounds very crunchy and, and, uh, uh, like, hippie-ish, but it's all very holistic and, like, it all, it, it all either works as one big system, or if it's siloed off, it's just gonna completely break. Um, and, and marketing and product and engineering are gonna be fighting uh, and pointing fingers at each other uh, when the shit hits the fan. So, um, everyone together, not separate. Uh, yeah, anywho, so I left, I, left, uh, I left Boundary about a year ago, um, before they sold, and, uh, and it was, um, you know, it, it, was, it was tough because, uh, you know, I didn't get to charge up my, uh, I didn't get to charge up my savings after I left, right? You know, um, so I, 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 I put all my savings into starting Boundary um, and then took the startup salary for a very long time. And so it's like, okay, uh, I, I can live for about a month. Uh, cool, let's go do another startup. And uh, <laughs> uh, thankfully it worked. Um, it, uh, it probably shouldn't have worked, but it did work, and uh, we're still doing it today. Anywho, and we've built something we're very proud of that's in public beta right now. Um, so this is the sales portion here, um, you know, but uh, not, to, not to turn it into a product pitch, uh, but one of the things I kept seeing at Boundary was that, like, all of our customers had Nagios, and they all hated it. Um, and so the easy way to think about what, what, what Opsi does is that um, if you were to design Nagios from the ground up, for the on-call developer in AWS, that's what we do. Um, and if that sounds cool to you, if that's something that, that appeals to you, um, please come and either see me or sign up or um, express interest in some way. And anywho, this is one of my favorite, one of the favorite things I like to say is that, um, you know, especially in like the startup world, like everyone loves to give you advice. It's all probably wrong. <laughs> or it's, it's either gonna be the wrong or too generic or whatever. Uh, and so inevitably what you end up doing is that you um, you're going to just screw up in new and interesting ways. But as long as, you're, as long as you're screwing up in new and interesting ways, at least you're learning something. Uh, so just, just make different mistakes this time and, uh, you know, hope for the best. Anywho, uh, if anyone has any questions or sign up, our operators are standing by. Right, right. So, so, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, that was in the abstract. The, the illusion there was at the very beginning, though, right? So if you're, if you're a systems engineer coming out of, like, a Facebook or a Google, um, uh, so, so the, the problems faced by a very large company are extremely different than the problems faced by a small one, right? So if you have, so if you have, cust so in other words, if you're building a company that needs to scale up to, you know, millions of dollars in ARR and, and, and so forth, um, there's only so many Facebooks and Googles in the world. And, it, and it's a very power law type of distribution between the scale they operate at. So there's th 
thousands of companies, like no, 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 more, like, like there's hundreds of thousands of companies, even more, who operate in a much smaller scale, who have much simpler problems, uh, who will pay you money to solve them. The Facebooks and Googles of the world hire teams of people, like you coming out of Facebook and Google, uh, to build the things that you think you're gonna build and sell to other people. Uh, so you need to be very, very careful that you're not just trying to solve Facebook and Google's problems because no one else gives a shit. Um, <laughs> You know, or, or a very small number of people really care, and you're not going to sell to Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, so it, it's very, it, it's it, you need to be very careful, like trying to use the infrastructure team of a large company as like the incubator for your startup. Um, you need to be very, very uh, rigorous about making sure you've picked out a customer in the market and you've talked to a ton of people. So like part of what, and, and again, this isn't this isn't the technical side, but it's so important is that like you need to talk to tons and tons of people out in the field doing the job that you think you're gonna help make better um, and say, hey, is this something that's useful to you? What do you do today? Like, what are your big problems? Like, you need to talk to them before you do any of that. So it, and if you just come out of Facebook and be like, ah, scuba, you know, you're, gonna, you're probably gonna have a bad time. I'm, you know, good luck to everyone that does it, but uh, I've been down the road and I don't wanna go again, so. <laughs> It's, it's a tough transition to make, especially if you're going from like individual, like if you've never done management before, it sucks. I uh, like, like, and if you don't have any like coaches or whatever, it's so hard to do and you're gonna make so many mistakes. Um, you know, the, the, the things you can do to prepare for it, uh, you know, probably wait until you do a startup. Like go, go get some experience. No, I'm serious. Like the, go get some experience. Like go get a couple of minute, like, like work up to management somewhere. Um, I mean, my, so like I kind of like take, I know it's kind of shitty, but like I sort of have this Hunter S. Thompson philosophy of like, don't use me as, as an example. Because <laughs> uh, like I came from an, like an individual, con like I went from like, like Ruby on Rails programmer, NoSQL guy, startup founder, CEO. I, I don't recommend that, that step function because it's kind of kind of drastic uh, and very stressful. Um, but you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. Um, so I think that one of the best things to do is to, is to cultivate a lot of mentors and a lot of people that you feel very comfortable being very, very blunt and open with, that they're not gonna like go and talk a bunch of shit about you behind your back because you're bearing your soul to them. Um, during some of the dark days, uh, having friends like that where I could like show up at their house with a bottle of whiskey and be like, yo dude, I got some stuff to talk about, well, probably kept me from like losing it completely. Um, and the good news is if you get through the dark days, uh, your heart will harden up into a, a tiny little speck uh, and nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna bother you anymore. So you got that look to look forward to if you get through it all. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>